So we'll kick off with our web for this webinar, our new product, which is our EDV with AstraZen, a little bit about optimal vegan nutrition as well. So, Creda from if there's anything else that um, we might correspond with you after the webinar if there's questions that aren't answered during it. All right, just trying to advance my slides here. All right, so um, I'll just start with this little anecdote, which I really like. Um, so some of you might know, have heard about Dr. Weston Price. So he was a dentist who was very interested in studying traditional um, tribes who ate traditional diets and how that impacted on their dental and their overall health. Um, so he traveled the world and at some stage, I think it was about the 1930s, he um, was very interested to see if he could find a tribe that existed solely on a vegan diet. Um, so we're not here to criticize, to say a vegan diet is right or wrong, but just to really look at what vegans may need to supplement in their diets. Anyway, so Dr. Um, Weston Price went to the South Sea Islands where um, the islanders were um, eating mainly plants and some seafoods. And he wanted to find some tribes in the interior of the largest islands um, who he believed might um, be able to achieve optimal health on only plant products because they didn't have access to um, the seafoods. Um, but what he found was that um, these people had um, the knowledge that they did have to have some foods from the sea at least every three months, otherwise they would not remain in good health. Um, and interestingly, even during periods of bitter warfare, um, the people from the mountain district would come down and place in um, boxes plants which only grew at the high altitude, and they would return the following night to obtain the seafood, so fish or other marine foods that were placed in the boxes by the people from the sea, which I found um, really interesting and lovely. And um, the people knew that if they could not get the seafoods that they had to resort to cannibalism um, to survive in good health. And apparently the livers of fishermen were extremely highly prized. But of course, I think this for the sea people leaving some seafoods in caches was preferable to, um, to that. So um, yeah, from, from that is just one example of how we know that seafoods are really important for everyone. So um, the benefits of the long-term omega-3s that we um, are officially allowed, allowed to declare are um, benefits for heart function, brain structure and function, and vision, and also for um, the structure and function of the developing brain and eyes in the fetus and in breastfed infants. And then in larger doses also um, benefits for blood pressure and decreasing triglyceride levels. And apart from that, we, we know that um, long chain omega-3s, especially EPA, are important for regulating inflammation and supporting immune function, as well as supporting mood, energy production, and in fact, supporting each and every system in the body in, um, in one way or another because each cell membrane has EPA and DHA as part of it. So it controls the substances entering and leaving um, the cells. Uh, and also, as we'll hear more, EPA is really important in regulating inflammatory response um, and immune function. So vegetarian, vegan, plant-based diets and all sorts of permutations of those like um, veganism, veganism, we all know they're increasing the rapid rate um, in the UK and worldwide. So um, one stat that I found was about 10% of those in the UK 
are now either vegetarian, vegan, or flexitarian, which would, uh, and they're about 700,000 vegans in the UK. And I'm sure every day that figure changes. And there are many reasons. Um, so it could be ethical reasons, environmental, religious reasons, health reasons, just the fact that it's trendy and probably a combination of all of those. So the main dietary sources of omega-3 um, in the diet generally, um, there are short chain sources and long chain sources. So the short chain sources are plant foods um, and um, those short chains are ALA, alpha linolenic acid, um, which is quite common and then relatively uncommon in foods that we consume is, is SDA, steroidonic acid. Um, so seeds, the seeds are, that are especially high in omega-3 are, for example, flax and chia seeds, um, seed oil such as flaxseed oil, um, and nuts and walnuts are especially high in short-chain omega-3s. And then the long chains are only found in animal foods. So vegans would not have access to long chain omega-3s in their diet. And um, the main source of, of long chain omega-3s are oily fish. So um, fish like salmon, mackerel, sardines, herrings, and anchovies. And to a lesser extent, other traditionally fed animal products. So a little bit in grass fed animal meats and eggs. All right, so um, short chain omega-3s in the diet need to be converted to long chain. Um, but it's not as simple as that because they do convert extremely poorly to EPA and DHA. So under ideal circumstances, only 8% um, of ALA taken in would convert to EPA and DHA and SDA um, is a bit better because it's further in the conversion pathway, um, but still only about 30% would convert. However, this is really influenced by lots of factors which can decrease the, the conversion rate a lot. So lack of micronutrient cofactors, um, age, gender, other medical conditions, and the amount of omega-6 in the diet um, all decreases the conversion rate. So um, we really do need a source of those long chain EPA and DHAs to ensure that we have enough of them. Um, relying on the conversion um, isn't a wise idea. So in the past, um, the, before um, agriculture, the natural human diet consisted of a range of animal and marine products, plants, nuts and seeds. Um, such that the omega-6 to 3 ratio was about 2 to 1. And now with the standard Western diet, we know that's more like 15 to 20 to 1. Um, and unfortunately, although the vegan diet can be healthier and is healthier in some aspects, um, vegans certainly can have a high omega-6 to omega-3 ratio um, by eating nuts and seeds, seed oils and grains, um, that contain omega-6s, so even healthy sources of those, and then also unhealthy sources, such as in processed and fried foods. Um, and they don't have any EPA and DHA naturally in the diet to balance that ratio out. Um, so vegans can certainly have a high omega-6 to omega-3 ratio, which can counteract some of the health benefits of the diet um, and also give rise to inflammatory conditions. So just a glance at omega-3 supplements which are available. So the ones in green are the plant sources and then in red is, is fish oil. So we've got um, seed oils, for example, um, flaxseed, um, so flaxseed and flaxseed oil, which is mostly ALA, um, echium seed oil, which is SDA and ALA, and a bit of GLA thrown in there, um, fish oils, and um, you get EPA only, DHA and EPA and DHA only fish oils, and then algae oils. And we'll take a closer look at, at these all in turn. So flaxseed oil. So eating flaxseeds, um, taking in flaxseed oil is the most common um, way to increase or people 
that vegans are advised to increase their omega-3 levels via the diet. And um, it's still really beneficial to take these in um, for fiber, for protein, phytonutrients, cholesterol lowering effects. But um, to rely on these to boost EPA and DHA levels is really not um, reliable. So we've, we've talked about the, the factors that can influence that. So um, the vitamins and minerals um, are zinc, magnesium, vitamin B3, B6, and C that are important. So if any of these minerals are lacking in the diet, the conversion will further decrease. All right. Um, then AKM seed oil. So AKM seed oil is the, um, the richest supplement source of SDA. Um, and that's a product that we've had for a while and that um, has been the product that um, we've been able to recommend um, to vegans looking to boost um, long chain omega-3. It does boost EPA more than DHA, um, which can be a good thing and a bad thing. So it's a good thing in that most people are more deficient in EPA than DHA. Um, and vegans who are taking algae oil um, will be getting either a DHA only or a DHA rich product. So um, that, that's why it can be good for HM seed oil to boost EPA levels specifically. Um, but some people might want a DHA, a product that boosts DHA. For example, pregnant or breastfeeding women might want the DHA um, to boost the brain and eye development in their babies. All right, so this is just looking at the EPA raising capacity of 1,000 milligrams of plant seed oil. So if we look at flaxseed oil, um, that's mostly ALA, 55.8% ALA. If you took in 1,000 milligrams of flaxseed oil, that would convert to about 45 milligrams of EPA in total. Um, if we look at the last column at hemp seed oil, so hemp seed does contain a little bit of SDA and some ALA, but it's mostly omega-6 LA. And if you took in 1,000 milligrams of hemp seed oil, you would only get a conversion to about 2.4 milligrams of EPA. So hemp seed oil is not a great idea, um, much less conversion than with flaxseed oil to long chain omega-3s. And then in the, media, in the middle is echium seed oil. So that contains 14.4% SDA, 32.5% ALA. And that gives a slightly better conversion rate to 69 milligrams of EPA. But as you can see, you'd still need to take in quite a lot to get a good conversion. All right, the fish oils, we're not going to talk about much here because um, we, we're looking for an alternative to fish oils. Um, and so I'll just move on to algae oil. So this is our new product, our vegan omega-3 algae oil with astaxanthin. Um, so it contains both DHA and EPA in the maximum ratio that is available currently in the UK. Um, so the earlier generations of algae oil were DHA only, and most were actually used in infant formulas. Um, but, and then later, then the EPA and DHA algae oil came onto the market. Um, they're a much better choice for reasons that we'll go into in a moment. Um, and basically the maximum ratio that you can get is two parts DHA to one part EPA. So all the all the algae oils on the market are DHA rich at the moment. Um, with, in time, um, there will be licenses to produce EPA rich oils and EPA only algae oils, but we're not there yet. So that's the best that we can do. So algae oil is the only plant-based source of long chain omega-3s. And while we might associate fish as being the primary source of DHA and EPA, in the marine food chain, fish actually get DHA and EPA by eating algae. So algae is actually the primary source of DHA and EPA. And by, go, by taking algae oil, we're cutting out the middle fish, as some would say. 
So algae oil is from the schizo... Sorry, I should have practiced pronouncing this. Schizotrichium species of microalgae. And it's grown in a closed system on land. So it's not from the ocean. It doesn't disrupt the ocean ecosystem. And it's naturally contaminant free. So free of PCBs, dioxins, and heavy, heavy metals. Um, and we talked about the fact that we can't get um, EPA rich algae oil yet. So we are using DHA and EPA algae oil. So it's really um, a, a choice for those who don't want to take fish oil for whatever reason, but also those who are concerned about sustainability. So it's not possible to fulfill the EPA and DHA requirements of the world's population from fish alone. Um, so we do need an alternative source and algae to the rescue and it has other benefits as well. So um, algae uses carbon as an energy source. Um, so it can actually offset excess carbon dioxide in the environment. So I saw a stat that said if there was an algae plant which covered um, the surface area of Algeria that could offset um, all the air transport um, CO2 emissions in the world. And um, what's great about growing algae is that it thrives in sunny, dry conditions. Um, so places where farming is impossible. So um, in deserts in North Africa, for example, um, it's a great place to make algae oil. And um, there are um, byproducts of making algae oil, which are used in great ways. So for animal feed, for biofuel. Um, so all in all, it's a great environmentally friendly choice. But is it as good as taking fish oil? So basically, gram for gram, yes, it should be because the EPA and DHA that comes from algae oil should be exactly the same as that from fish oil. So here are just two studies. So um, in the first one, in a 12-week intervention, participants were given quite a low dose, so 254 milligrams of algae oil, DHA and EPA daily. And their omega-3 index increased from 3.1 to 4.8 after just 12 weeks. So the omega-3 index is a measure of um, the percentage of EPA and DHA in our cell membranes. So um, we have a test that measures that um, and some other things, which I'll talk about later, the OPTIO3 test. Um, and basically the omega-3 index is a predictor of cardiovascular health. So um, less than four is a high risk for cardiovascular disease, four to eight is medium risk and above eight is um, really low risk and we really like to aim for above eight. Um, and then in the study below, they used a, a better dose, so 940 milligrams of DHA only algae oil um, for eight weeks. And these participants had their omega-3 index rise from 4.8 to 8.4%. Um, so they, they went from quite low in the medium risk category to in the ideal risk category for cardiovascular disease after just eight weeks. Um, so they had a DHA only oil and their um, DHA percentage rose from 4.4 to 7.9% and their EPA from 0.41 to 0.48%. So um, that indicates that there is some conversion of DHA to EPA, but not a whole lot. All right, so um, DHA is really important for the structure of cell membranes. Whereas EPA is more involved in inflammation and immunity. And almost all of us have lower levels of EPA than DHA. And I can say that because we get the results of the OPTO3 tests and um, almost without fail, everyone is really low in EPA. Um, so even in pregnancy where DHA is really important for fetal brain and eye development, there's still a role for taking EPA with DHA. So EPA helps DHA cross the placenta and incorporate into the fetal brain. Um, the reason for that is free fatty acids need to be bound for transfer to the fetal circulation. And EPA has effects on 
the gene expression of fatty acid transport proteins that take the DHA across the placenta to the fetal circulation. And then EPA also increases the expression of fatty acid binding proteins on all cells, and they are especially strongly expressed in the developing brain cells. So it helps bind DHA to the transport proteins to get across the placenta, and it also helps the brain cells to, in a way, suck DHA into them. So really important. Um, EPA also counteracts the pro-oxidant effect of high-dose standalone DHA. All right, so taking high doses of DHA only um, can actually have a pro-oxidant effect because DHA is so much more prone to oxidation than EPA. Um, another reason to take EPA with DHA and especially to take astaxanthin with your DHA product as well because astaxanthin is a great antioxidant. Um, the pregnancy environment is naturally pro-inflammatory anyway, so also a great idea to have some EPA and astaxanthin in there. Um, and then a higher AA to EPA ratio increases the risk of preeclampsia and preterm labor. So AA is arachidonic acid, which is a long chain omega-6 um, and EPA, um, has a, um, almost an opposite action to it. So a high AA level can be pro-inflammatory, whereas um, EPA is anti-inflammatory. So by looking at that ratio, we can um, estimate the, the amount of inflammation in the body or the inflammatory potential in the body. Um, the higher that is, the more chance there is of preeclampsia and preterm labor. And um, where EPA directly helps in that is it um, prevents oxidation of the placenta and also it relaxes the uterine muscles. So um, who's algae oil particularly suitable for? So for vegans, vegetarians, those that have a fish allergy <coughs> or some other side effect to fish oil that would make them not want to take fish oil. And um, those who are environmentally focused and then those who particularly want a DHA rich product. So pregnant women, breastfeeding women, um, young children because their brains are still growing and developing. And perhaps those with um, certain eye conditions because there's a high concentration of DHA in the eyes. And who might not want to take algae oil but might want to perhaps take fish oil instead. So um, those who want an EPA only or an EPA rich oil. So those with inflammatory conditions, um, those with immune conditions. Um, and then when initiating supplementation, so often um, we recommend that people start off with a pure EPA product for a few months just to boost that EPA um, level, which is often really low before they move on to a product containing EPA and DHA. And then those people with a, a proven low EPA in relation to DHA. So maybe they've had um, an Optio 3 test um, and we can tell them that their levels of EPA are really low and um, they should try and boost those first. Um, and, and costs. So at the moment, um, because of the technology, algae oil is more expensive. We do um, hope that in the future that cost might come down. Um, but gram for gram at the moment, it is still cheaper to buy fish oil than our algae oil. Um, so you might wonder why I'm mentioning this slide in, in a talk about veganism. Well, some dietary vegans who have health conditions are prepared to take um, fish oil supplements, whether it's just for a short time, just to try and improve, boost their EPA levels um, or to improve a condition a little bit before moving on to um, an algae oil or possibly even long term. So depending on, you know, if one's well and healthy, you might be happy to, to, to take an algae oil. But of course, those who are really ill and looking to address health conditions might make an exception for that. All right, so um, just in summary, this is our product. Um, yeah, Janus Vegan Omega-3 and Astaxanthin, 100% plant-based DHA and EPA um, with Astaxanthin. So um, it is a high strength, 55% Omega-3 oil. 
So that is higher than your standard fish oil that you would buy on the high street or for a cheap price online, um, but not as concentrated as our other fish oils. And that's just because that is the strength that we can get um, algae oil in at the moment. So it's in the nature identical triglyceride form, which has high bioavailability. Um, of course, compared to our really high quality fish oils, they're in the RTG form. They have even higher bioavailability, but um, this is okay. Um, it's better than low quality fish oils, definitely. Um, as I said, it's naturally free from contaminants. I'm definitely superior to short chain omega-3 plant products and completely sustainable. So just have a look at the nutritional information. Um, per capsule, um, there's 200 milligrams of DHA and 100 milligram of EPA. There's a bit of rosemary oil and um, vitamin E for antioxidation. And then we have this astaxanthin um, complex added. So um, there's astaxanthin, lutein, and the trio of xanthins. Um, which is really great for antioxidation and also for eye health. And in each capsule, there's 0.5 milligrams of astaxanthin. So per dose, we'd like to recommend a dose of two capsules a day. Per dose, there would be 400 milligrams of DHA, 200 milligrams of EPA, making 600 milligrams of long chain omega-3s and one milligram of astaxanthin. Um, the product is free from fish, dairy, gluten, lactose, soy yeast, artificial colors and flavorants, hasn't been tested on animals and non-GMO, um, suitable for halal and kosher diets and small, easy to swallow capsules. And the, as I said, the doses we recommend for adults and children aged 12 plus is one capsule twice daily. So if, if there were financial constraints, one, ta one capsule daily would be um, the kind of absolute minimum and it's probably the same dose you would find on in other products but um, we like to give clinically effective doses um, so that's why we recommend two a day. Um, for intensive support the dose can be increased to four capsules daily and then for children um, one capsule daily would be okay. And they are really small and easy to swallow. So from the time the children are able to swallow capsules, they could take them. So just comparing um, this product to other um, products that are the sort of standard high street, um, cheaper supplements. So we looked at a krill oil, a cod liver oil, and a fish body oil supplement. So in the left-hand column is just the per dose, which we've discussed already. And then um, we converted that um, to one gram of oil just to comp compare it to the, some other products. So if you took one gram of our oil, you would get 295 milligrams, sorry, 298 milligrams of DHA, 149 milligrams of EPA and 75 micrograms of astaxanthin. Um, if you had to look at krill, krill oil, so krill oil isn't such a big thing nowadays, but a few years ago it was, was really a big thing. And there were two reasons why people wanted to take krill oil. The one is that um, we heard it was really bioavailable because of the phospholipid structure, which is true. But the dose per capsule and per gram of oil is, is really low. So you would have to take a huge amount of krill oil to get your DHA and EPA and it's also really expensive. So it's not a good way of supplementing DHA and EPA. Um, and then also the other benefit of krill oil is that it contains astaxanthin. But as you can see, our product contains more astaxanthin um, per gram than krill oil um, and a lot more DHA and EPA. Um, then looking at cod liver oil, um, so also much lower levels of DHA and EPA with no astaxanthin. And then 30% um, fish body oil. So that would be your um, cheaper fish oil supplements. And often one might see on the bottle, um, one gram or a thousand milligrams per dose, but that would be of the oil. If you look at it 
only being a 30% concentration oil, then you could only be getting um, 300 milligrams of DHA and EPA and also no astaxanthin. So um, this product compares really favorably to kind of your standard other supplements. So um, why did we add astaxanthin? Um, so astaxanthin is um, from another different algae. So we've got two different algaes in this product. Um, it's from the H. pluvialis microalgae. Um, and this is the algae responsible for um, the pigmentation that you find in flamingos, salmon, and crabs that feed on this algae. Um, so it is nature's most potent antioxidant. And unlike some other antioxidants, it is a pure antioxidant, which means it never becomes a pro-oxidant. So some other antioxidants, if you take them in isolation, in high doses, and you don't have enough other antioxidants in your diet or in supplements to back them up, they can become pro-oxidant. Um, not good news. But astaxanthin never does this. Um, and it's unique in that it spans the cell membrane. So it works outside the cell membrane, inside the cell membrane, and inside the actual cell to um, fight free radicals. And one astaxanthin molecule can work on, on up to 19 free radicals at the same time. So we add um, astaxanthin to this product for two reasons. The one is to protect the oil while it's in the capsule um, and while it's in your body. Um, and uh, the other is just for its amazing antioxidant effects. Um, and we know that DHA is more susceptible to oxidation than EPA. So that's why it's really important to take it in a DHA rich product. Um, and we think we're quite unique in this regard. We haven't seen other um, algae oil plus astaxanthin products. Then just a little bit of research. You can take a deeper dive into this if you're interested um, about combining omega-3 and astaxanthin. So these are studies that were done in rats. The first one looked at, um, at combining fish oil and astaxanthin. Um, and found that it modulated lymphocytes, so it's a kind of white blood cell function. Um, so it prevented oxidative stress induced by um, the fatty acids and potentiated the immunomodulatory effects of the fish oil. And then in the second study, um, combined astaxanthin and fish oil, I say fish oil here, but basically we're looking at EPA and DHA, which is the same that you would get in the algae oil. Um, so combining um, those two improved the glutathione-based redox balance in rat plasma and neutrophils. So they looked at the redox balance, um, free radical generation, and white blood cell function. Um, and they found that this was all benefited by combining the astaxanthin with the omega-3. Um, and they um, hypothesized that habitual consumption of omega-3 and astaxanthin lowered the risk of um, vascular and infectious diseases. All right, so we've talked about pregnancy. Just to, to note that um, pregnant women are really aware about um, contamination of fish. So they're advised to eat no more than two portions of fish per week because of potential contamination. Um, now, they might get scared off by that. I think a lot are, or some probably don't even eat fish to start off with, but those that did before they were pregnant might get scared off by the risk of contamination and eat even less. And um, they might have the same worries about fish oil supplements, whether they also contaminate this. They might not want to take fish oil supplements in pregnancy. And as a result, um, many pregnant women end up with really low levels of omega-3. Um, and we're hoping that with this algae oil product, it will really encourage pregnant women to um, take an omega-3 supplement because um, there will be no concerns. It's naturally free from, from contamination as it's grown in a closed system on land. Um, so it's a great product for pregnant women. And we've spoken about why having EPA along with DHA is a really good idea 
um, not just taking a DHA only supplement. So I just wanted to tell you about our OptiO3 test that we have. Um, so it's a finger prick test that um, clients can do at home. So either practitioners can order it um, from us on our website um, or clients can order it themselves. It's a little kit that comes in a plastic box that looks like that. It only needs two drops of blood. Um, clients then send the test back to us. Um, we analyze it and send out a report and the report inclu includes a full fatty acid breakdown. Um, the three most important markers that we look at are the omega-3 index. So that's the amount of EPA and DHA in the cell walls. And um, we look at the red blood cells um, and that's a marker of the rest of the cells in the body. And it's a predictor of cardiovascular health. So an omega-3 index of more than eight indicates a low risk of cardiovascular health, four to eight, sort of a gray zone and less than four um, is really high risk. Um, yeah, then the omega-6 to 3 ratio, we'll measure that. And we also measure the AA to EPA ratio. And that's a marker of um, either inflammation that's currently ongoing in the body or the inflammatory potential in the body. And then we also look at the levels of EPA and DHA on their own. Um, and from that, we can give someone a personalized product recommendation. So um, whether it would be most beneficial for them to have um, an EPA only, an EPA rich product, um, DHA rich product, and also a dosage recommendation. So we look at um, their weight and calculate um, what dosage would be required to bring their omega-3 levels into an optimum range. So um, there are a few um, case, well, different scenarios where, where this test is really beneficial. Um, seeing as this is a talk about um, veganism, I think the one might be in a vegan client who um, either doesn't believe that they need omega-3 supplementation or is unsure of whether they do. So maybe they're really taking in a lot of short-chain omega-3s in their diet um, and they think that they're doing fine. Um, this test is a really good way to take the guesswork out of um, you know, knowing whether the, their status is fine or not. So in that situation, I'd recommend it. Um, also in someone who comes to you with health complaints and you're not really sure what the cause of the complaints is. So um, with, if one wants to know whether a poor omega status is the cause of the complaints or contributing significantly um, to symptoms, one could do a test um, in those cases. And then the other... Um, um, time to use it is to monitor response to supplementation. So um, once someone's been on supplements for a while and they want to know whether, whether the amount of supplements that they're taking is adequate to maintain their levels, um, one could do the test then. Um, and, you know, if you're not really sure, um, if you have any questions, you can always contact us and we'll advise about that. Um, and in, in our vegan clients, obviously we can't, who aren't prepared to take, you know, who want to take vegan supplements, um, we can't recommend um, an EPA rich fish oil, obviously, but what, if we saw that their EPA levels were uh, markedly decreased in relation to their DHA, what we would recommend um, is that they take an algae oil, which would boost their DHA levels more than EPA, but then possibly in conjunction with um, a product like Echiomega, which has SDA, which would boost their EPA levels. Um, but that's all something that, that can be discussed. And, you know, a lot of practitioners, um, we, do, we do discuss the results of the test and what would be the optimal recommendation for their client. So, um, yeah, you can order that product on our website along with any other products. So is there still a place for AKM seed oil? So we spoke briefly about um, how it converts more to EPA than DHA. So definitely for those who are EPA depleted, who um, can't or don't want to take fish oil, they can take it along with um, an algae oil supplement. <coughs> it also contains GLA, gamma linoleic acid, which is um, 
an anti-inflammatory omega-6 as one of the good omega-6s. Um, so good for um, anti-aging and smoothing, hydrating effects on skin. Um, it is also anti-inflammatory. It um, can help some with PMS symptoms. Um, it also has some beneficial cardiovascular effects and it has a favorable effect on cholesterol, interestingly, by a different mechanism to that of long-chain omega-3s. So while long-chain omega-3s um, help cholesterol by increasing HDL and decreasing triglycerides, um, Echium seed oil decreases total cholesterol and LDL and VLDL. So that's quite interesting, works synergistically for cholesterol benefits. All right, and then we'll just move on to looking at um, other nutrients that vegans living in the UK may be deficient in. So why I say in the UK is it really depends on what country one's living in. So if one's living in a sunny area, getting lots of sun, you wouldn't need vitamin D maybe. If you're living in a country where they put iodine in table salt, you maybe wouldn't need iodine. So this is specifically for um, vegans in the UK. So on the left, um, I put the deficiencies that are almost inevitable. So long chain omega-3s, EPA and DHA, B12, vitamin D and iodine, and then deficiencies that are possible. One needs to just take each um, client on a case by case basis and look at whether they might be deficient. <clears throat> okay, so just a little word about short chain omega-3s. So we've already covered why one needs long chains. So we don't need to forget about the short chains altogether. They are still important for fiber, protein, minerals, phytonutrients, cholesterol benefits, skin, and hair. Okay, so good sources of the short chain omega-3s, ALA, are flax seeds, flaxseed oil, chia seeds, hemp seeds, and walnuts. And then, um, there are some healthy sources of short chain omega-6s. So nuts, for example, almonds, seeds, for example, sunflower seeds. And we do need these to some degree. We, we mustn't have no omega-6s at all. And the reason actually is that arachidonic acid, which is seen as kind of the bad boy driver of inflammation, which it is, and most people have too much arachidonic acid, but we don't want none at all because it does drive inflammation, but it also switches off inflammation when inflammation is no longer needed. So if you have absolutely no omega-6, you might start an inflammatory response, but not be able to switch it off. And we can also look at the AA levels when we do the OptiO3 test and check that it's in the right range. I must say we hardly ever, never see someone with an AA that's too low, but um, we would obviously advise if it was. All right, and then loads of unhealthy sources of omega-6s, so vegetable, seed oils, um, like canola, corn oil, sun, sorry, sunflower oil, big one, um, processed foods, fried foods, um, so we don't want excess omega-6s, um, both to disrupt, yeah, the omega-6 to 3 ratio, so that we don't have um, too high a ratio, um, and also the more omega-6s we have around, um, the less short-chain omega-3s can be converted to EPA and DHA because they both share the same enzymes, the delta-6 desaturase enzymes and other enzymes. Um, so if the omega-6s are around using those enzymes, the omega-3s can't use them. All right, let's move to B12. I think that's the one that almost everybody um, knows about and, and hopefully takes. So vitamin B12 is made by bacteria that live in the soil and in the guts of animals. So animals eating grass get B12 and B12 producing bacteria from clumps of dirt around grass roots. And chickens and birds get B12 from picking around in the soil for worms and insects. These animals then store B12 in their livers and muscles and some pass B12 into their milk and eggs. Um, so obviously vegans wouldn't be getting any B12 that way. Um, but interestingly enough, um, these days even omnivores need to watch out for low B12 levels because 
animals don't feed naturally anymore. So they're not um, getting um, the grass and the soil. And even if they did, pesticides often kill the B12 producing bacteria and insect in the soil. And heavy antibiotic use kills the B12 producing bacteria in the guts of farm animals. So 90% um, of B12 supplements in the world are actually fed to livestock. Now, in our own colons, we do make B12, but it is produced downstream from where it is absorbed in the ileum. So that's not of much use to us. So um, we need to get in B12, well, vegans do, from either fortified food or supplements. Now, fortified foods can be problematic for two reasons. The one is that it's really difficult to know how much you're getting in. So it's really not reliable. And secondly, um, fortified foods often contain the cyanocobalamin um, form of B12, which is difficult for some people to absorb. So to absorb that, you need um, perfect pH, you need intrinsic factor, you need to be able to methylate it. So um, that's, that's another reason why fortified foods aren't great at meeting requirements. And um, we would really recommend supplementation with supplementation with a methyl cobalamin form. Um, so just to go back to why it's important, B12 is important for methylation, amino acid, fatty acid, and cholesterol metabolism, red blood cell production, DNA synthesis, and nervous system function. And um, with deficiency, you can get um, anemia, which goes along with fatigue and shortness of breath, um, neurological problems, which includes cognitive difficulties. And the sad thing is that once um, some of these problems are diagnosed, they aren't always reversible. So really prevention is, is um, the way to go. Um, but because B12 is stored and recycled in the body, it can take years to manifest. So someone might begin eating a vegan diet, not supplement, and for years they seem healthy, so they think that they don't need supplements. And then um, deficiency can creep up slowly um, with vague symptoms and can take a while to realize that it's because of B12. So all vegans need B12, I'm sure you'd agree. Um, the reason that I put adenosylcobalamin and hydroxylcobalamin in there is that um, some people who've been for genetic testing indicate that they might do better on those forms of B12. Um, but that's kind of a small, well, a subset of people who've been for in-depth testing. Um, and we are looking at bringing out a standalone B12, which will com um, combine all three forms. Um, but for now, we use methylcobalamin in our multivitamins and um, yeah, in all of our products that we use B12. So B12 is absorbed better in small regular doses than in large doses. The reference intake is 2.5 micrograms a day. And the dose in supplements varies wildly from 10 micrograms a day up to really large amounts. Um, it's difficult to know exactly how much one needs. <laughs> So one can do blood testing, and we'll discuss a little bit later. Um, it's really important to test active B12, not total B12 levels. Okay, so vitamin D. Um, so humans um, are programmed to make vitamin D whenever strong sunlight hits their bare skin. Um, but unfortunately, um, these days we don't get a lot of that because we indoors a lot of the time smog and clouds block sunlight um, and also sunscreen of course blocks sunlight um, also people with darker skin and older people need more sun exposure to produce vitamin d so um, as a kind of a guideline if if we had strong midday sun for about 10 to 20 minutes a day we'd probably be all right and um, for people over 70 about 30 minutes um, but we don't get that a lot of the time. And really all of us in the UK should supplement at least from October to March. So vitamin D is important for immunity, hormone production, cognitive function, and bone strength. And deficiency causes, um, amongst others, bone abnormalities and some chronic illnesses. So for vegans, there's really no reliable dietary source. So um, mushrooms exposed to UV light can contain vitamin D2, um, which is the less active form, 
but levels decrease with storage and with cooking. And who knows how many mushrooms you'd need to eat to get your um, daily requirements. Um, I certainly wouldn't want to bank on, on, on that for my D3. So um, the reference intake is 10 micrograms or 400 international units per day. And um, supplements also vary um, from between 400 IUs to 2000 IUs per day and even more. Um, the most effective form is the D3 form. And we use, we have a vegan D3 made from lichen, which is um, a great product and that's a thousand IUs per day. So um, GPs will do um, vitamin D level testing and it's the right test, um, the 25 hydroxy vitamin D test. Um, so you can get that done with your GP or in private. Um, but for most people supplementing up to 2000 IUs a day long term should be absolutely safe and shouldn't drive your levels up too much. But if you are worried that your levels are either too low or too high, um, you can ask your GP for a test. All right, then um, iodine. So plant foods provide iodine. Um, so vegans are no different to um, omnivores in that respect. But the amount present really depends on soil content. And um, the soil content of all minerals is dropping and dropping um, due to modern agricultural methods. Um, so we really can't um, be sure that we get enough iodine from our diet. Now, some countries put iodine in their table salt. Um, so their um, residents usually get enough iodine. Um, not so in the UK. So in the UK, um, there's no iodine in table salt. Um, instead, um, animals um, are given iodine. So there's iodine in cattle feed and in the cleaning solution used in dairies. So those um, eating omnivorous diets and um, drinking milk should be getting enough iodine, but um, obviously vegans aren't doing that. And um, vegans are probably not going to be ordering iodized table salt, although some do. But with salt, obviously you don't want to eat too much salt. And who measures exactly how much salt they eat every day? So to be assured you get enough iodine and the right amount, it's really easy just to take a supplement. So you might be taking a multivitamin that already has um, iodine in it. So the reference intake is 150 micrograms a day. And a lot of multivitamins do contain just that amount. Um, so in our multivitamin, we have 150 micrograms a day, um, as in a lot of other products. Um, so some vegans might want to eat sea vegetables rich in iodine, but that can be a bad idea because um, some of them contain really high levels of iodine and you might be getting in too much iodine that way. Um, so it's been suggested that one that is quite stable is nori and if you ate two sheets of nori a day, you could um, meet your iodine requirements. Um, so deficiency in iodine causes hypothyroidism. Um, and goiter, so enlarged thyroid gland in adults, um, cretinism in babies, and abnormal cognitive development in children. So really important to be aware of that. All right. So zinc. Now, the, um, there is zinc in a vegan diet, but the problem with zinc is twofold. The one is that it's in really nutritious whole foods. So those eating unhealthy vegan diets might not get enough zinc in their diets. So um, it's in legumes, seeds, nuts, and whole grains. And then the other problem is that um, it is the mineral most bound to phytates. Um, so even if one is eating all of those good things, you might be absorbing it. So phytates are substances found in nuts, seeds, grains, and legumes. Um, and they're often referred to as anti-nutrients because they bind minerals such as zinc, calcium, and iron um, at that particular meal that they um, eat in that. Um, they do have some health benefits such as antioxidants. Um, so we do want some phytates in our diet, but just um, not too many. So um, why is zinc important? It's important for immunity, wound healing, cognitive function, growth, protein, and DNA synthesis and enzyme reactions. 
and lots of different functions. And deficiency causes poor immunity, lack of taste and smell, poor growth and development in children, skin rashes, and cognitive problems. Um, so luckily, we can do something about phytates um, by using different food preparation methods. So soaking, sprouting, fermenting, and cooking does minimize phytates. So for example, if you're going to be cooking grains, soak them at least from the night before. Um, that will help get rid of phytates. If you're making, you're going to be eating oats, um, soak them overnight um, to decrease the phytates. But oats are really low in the enzyme phytase. So you might want to add a teaspoon of buckwheat flour because buckwheat is really high in phytase to break down the phytates. Um, and for example, fermenting, so um, sourdough bread, um, you'll absorb more zinc from sourdough bread because it's been fermented than um, non-fermented bread. So they're little tricks to increase um, the phytate. So if you're looking after, um, if you're paying attention to that, then you may well be getting enough zinc in your diet. Um, so in a vegan diet, it's also important to make sure your zinc levels are adequate because of the zinc copper balance. So um, vegan diets are naturally low in zinc, um, and higher in copper, and the zinc copper balance in the body is really important. So um, you might be getting zinc anyway in, in some multivitamin that you're taking, um, and it's really optional, and up to 20 milligrams a day um, could be beneficial. Then vitamin K2. So K2 differs from K1 in that K1 is more responsible for um, coagulation of blood and K2 is important for heart, bone and teeth health. So um, vitamin K1 is found in green leafy and cruciferous vegetables, lentils and some fruit, for example, blueberries. And vitamin K1 can be converted to K2 in the body, but it's inefficient. Um, so some people might be fine if they um, eating a diet high in leafy greens um, and they've got good, good gut health, they might not need a supplement, um, but uh, something worth considering. So K2, so you get different forms of K2. You get K2 MK4, which is usually found in animal products. Um, so vegans wouldn't be getting that, of course. And then K2 MK7. And the only reliable source of that is natto, which is a fermented soybean product, which is really difficult to come by in the UK and also difficult to stomach, apparently. I haven't had the pleasure of having any yet. Um, so um, if you have a healthy, really healthy vegan diet and you've got a healthy gut, um, then you might not need supplementation. But if you're targeting bone health or heart health, tooth health, then you might be considering a supplement. And also if you're taking um, a calcium supplement or a high dose vitamin D supplement. So if you have increased blood le levels of calcium in the body because you're taking in more calcium or because you're taking vitamin D to boost calcium absorption, you really want the calcium to go into the right place, so into the bones and into the teeth and not into the soft tissue. So the soft tissue as in the arteries, around the heart and other arteries in the body or the kidneys to cause kidney stones. So um, if you're taking those, then you really want to take some, some vitamin K too. But which one to choose? So I've done a little bit of reading in the last day um, after I made these slides. Um, so vitamin K1 converts to K2 MK4. Um, so if you're getting enough K1, you're getting some MK4. So then you might want to top up with some MK7, which is the form that we use in our multivitamin. Um, and if you're targeting bones and teeth, then you also want K2, MK7. Um, however, if you are an unhealthy vegan, following an unhealthy diet, not getting lots of green leafy veg, or if you've got poor gut health, then you might not be getting enough K1 to convert to MK4. And if you're really worried about your soft tissues, like you're someone who's got coronary artery disease or kidney stones, then you might want to look at a 
K2, MK4 supplement as well. All right, moving swiftly on. So calcium. Um, well, that's one of the things that one might think one would definitely be deficient um, in, in a vegan diet, but not necessarily. So it's important for healthy bones, muscles, heart and blood vessels, the nervous system, and normal blood clotting. And deficiency causes bone disease in children and adults, and other symptoms, maybe muscle cramps or neurological problems. So um, the sources on a vegan diet include fortified plant milk and fruit juice, calcium set firm tofu, blackstrap molasses, leafy greens, sesame and chia seeds, almonds, beans, oranges, dried figs. So there are quite a few foods high in calcium. And if you're eating a healthy whole food vegan diet, you may well be getting in enough calcium without doing anything special. Um, so calcium absorption is inhibited by oxalates in raw spinach, um, Swiss chard, rhubarb and beet greens, and also by phytates, as we talked about before. Um, so if you're eating a lot of raw spinach, um, then it's better to steam it first because steaming does get rid of the, um, or significantly decrease the oxalates. And if you're wanting to eat greens raw, then rather choose low oxalate greens such as kale or rocket, which are safer to eat raw without decreasing calcium absorption. Um, and then to make sure that you're getting enough calcium in, um, one easy way to do it is to use a calcium enriched um, plant milk. So for example, there's a really nice one that I use, which has calcium from, um, algae along with uh, soy milk, which is organic soy milk with no sugars or additives. So um, that's an easy way to get in more calcium. So um, those who might want to consider supplementation um, might be those who can't or don't want to um, eat tofu or fortified um, plant milk. Um, those who are targeting bone health, maybe with a strong family history of osteoporosis or a personal history thereof. And um, possibly women in the perimenopausal period um, who are facing accelerated bone loss. And if um, calcium supplementation is taken, um, ideally it shouldn't be taken alone. It should be taken in combination with other bone building minerals such as magnesium, vitamin D and K2, so that the calcium that is absorbed is sent to the right place, the bones <clears throat> and the teeth and not to the arteries or the kidneys. Um, and in a few months time, we'll be bringing out a, a really nice bone product, which combines all of those synergistic nutrients. So check back in a few months time. All right, then iron, it's important for hemoglobin, the oxygen carrier in the blood, and deficiency can cause fatigue, pallor, um, anemia, dizziness, and shortness of breath. So the vegan diet contains a less bioavailable non-heme iron um, from sources such as legumes, grains, nuts and seeds, and leafy greens. Now iron absorption is decreased by phytates, which we've mentioned before, um, tannins and caffeine, um, and it's increased by vitamin C consumption. So the solution to that is to increase a source, I mean, to include a vitamin C source with every meal. So for example, if you're eating your oats for breakfast, have some citrus or some kiwi fruit or mango with that. Um, at lunchtime, when you're having your bean and grain salad, add some red pepper or tomato to that. If you're making a kale smoothie, add some lemon to that, um, and that will all increase the iron absorption. Avoid drinking tea or coffee with meals as a general rule. Of course, herbal tea is all right, but um, not tea with um, lots of tannins and caffeine in it. We talked about um, phytates already. Um, and then iron supplements. Um, so, Small doses of iron are okay. So if you're taking a multivitamin with a small dose of iron in it, less than the RDA, that should be fine. But um, high dose iron supplements can do more harm than good. So really one should only take high dose iron supplements above the re daily reference intake um, with a proven iron deficiency. 
Um, so vegans can track their nutrient intake by using um, mobile apps or by seeing nutritionists who will help them do that. Um, and then some blood tests to consider. So the, for the omega levels, I mentioned our OptiO3 um, omega home finger prick test. Um, vitamin D levels, if one's concerned about too low or too high levels, um, can be done with a GP or privately. Then um, the active B12 or polotranscobalamin test. Um, now that has to be done in private because um, the NHS will only do the total B12 level. Um, so why it's important to know the active B12 level is um, active B12 only makes up a small fraction of the total B12 in the body, yet that is um, the form, so bound to um, transcobalamin that your body can actually take up into its cells and use. So if you did a um, total B12 level, that can still be preserved for quite a long time after the active B12 level has started to drop. So I might get a false sense of security. Um, and um, really by the time that the total B12 level has dropped, that's really late into a B12 deficiency. Um, so I'd advise anyone who's um, been following a vegan diet for um, several years to get an active B12 um, level checked. It won't really help right at the beginning because um, B12 is preserved for a while because it gets stored and recycled in the body. Um, but both to monitor levels after um, significant years of following a vegan diet and to monitor response to supplementation, that can be done. And then if one is worried about iron levels, don't take hydro supplements without a proven iron deficiency and um, iron tests can be done with um, one's GP or privately. <clears throat> so the supplements that we have that we recommend for general vegan health. So year round, we'd recommend um, our advanced multivitamin and minerals um, along with our new product that we spoke about, our vegan omega-3 and astaxanthin. And then a winter top up um, of our vegan vitamin D3. So that's a thousand I use per tablet. Um, you get 365 tablets um, in the bottle. So full year supply um, and based on lichen. And then for vegetarians, we also have the daily D3, which is made from lanolin and that's 2000 I use per tablet. All right, because we've gone over time, I don't think I'm gonna to talk to more about the summary. Um, you can go back and look at the slide. So, um, you know what to take and you know why it's really important to take our vegan omega-3. Um, all right, so for practitioners, we do have a special running at the moment until the end of August, 25% um, of um, the vegan omega-3. Um, that's for our practitioners who have an account um, with us. If you are a practitioner and you don't have an account yet, um, get in touch and we can set that up for you to get discounts on all of our products and also on the Vegan Omega 3, 25% off until um, the end of August. So thanks for listening. I hope that Nina was able to answer some of your questions as um, we went along. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.